Okay, good evening. We better make a start because with the number of questions that have been submitted uh, for tonight's Q&A, uh, as Roger said earlier, before people start to come in, we might finish by midnight tonight. So uh, uh, welcome to everybody uh, on uh, both our uh, Zoom, to our BIBA members, and also to uh, the people who are watching live on uh, YouTube as well. Uh, my name is Richard Senior. I'm one of the BIBA trustees I'm uh, hosting this evening. Uh, we've got Roger Patterson, who... It uh, doesn't really need an introduction nowadays. Uh, uh, but we've also got uh, Owen Megillah Kudder, who is co he's beaming live to us from uh, from over the waters in Ireland. Uh, so uh, great welcome to you, uh, to you, Owen. Uh, so we've got yeah. some uh, some questions that have come in to us uh, more than ever before. I think um, uh, when we've asked for questions coming in, which is really good. So. If your question doesn't get asked uh, of the panel, please do uh, accept my apologies, but we have had uh, rather a few questions. Uh, and maybe uh, the questions that we don't get around to answering, uh, we might be able to put something perhaps down in writing uh, and put that on the Bibber website for, uh, for people. Uh, so uh, the first question then, uh, if I share my screen, because some of these questions are rather long. Um, so the first question, uh, at my last inspection, before I closed up and wrapped up my hive, uh, every frame, 22 in the brood box, uh, they were solid with honey and nectar with no room for winter brood. Will they open up and feed on it over the winter so that the queen can lay in them? Um, shall we go to Owen first? Guests first. Yeah, OK. Um... Of course, this this autumn we've had some fantastic weather, and we had a um, we've we here anyway. We probably had the warmest autumn on record, and normally we would get a good ivy flow anyway. Uh, but this year, yeah, it, it was an incredible amount of ivy they took in, and um, it is you know um, I I'm a great believer. If you look at some of the old books, they there a lot of the beekeepers were not fans of ivy honey uh, because it clogged, basically clogged up the whole uh, brood box or brood boxes in this case. Um, I'm a huge fan of ivy honey. I think it's absolutely fantastic. The bees uh, use it really well. Now, I'm not really sure if they use much of it during the winter. Well, actually, during the winter, they don't use much stores anyway. It's the stores. It's really the spring um, when brood rearing gets in earnest again that the stores gets used. Um, so, and definitely in the springtime, ivy is absolutely fantastic. They have no problem, especially, I think, the uh, Apis mellifera mellifera has no problem um, dealing with ivy honey. Now, I would always, even though I would always expect to get ivy every year, I always feed a little bit of syrup because I, feed, I feel that the stored syrup then uh, helps them dilute that ivy down. They don't have to be relying on their own saliva for all intents and purposes when they can't. Uh, can't um, uh, collect water. Uh, now, when you if you have two brood boxes, absolutely um, chock block with ivy honey. Uh, that could like you know you. I mean, the queen is not going to. You would not expect the queen to lay much during uh, the winter, especially a cold winter. Now, if it's a mild winter, they'll probably brood all through the winter. Um, but um, I, I I looked at a couple of mine last week actually. It, it was a day. It was quite sunny and there was no wind. And I was worried about the same thing that be clogged. Now the ones I opened were shock blood. Now I would put on supers or I'd put on eeks for the ivy because I harvest the ivy in March. And um, I found I found plenty of brood, loads of brood. They had no problem, like you know. But uh, and, and they had obviously been using the ivy. Um, what, I mean, if you're there uh, and he is, I mean, is, um, the thing is, I don't know, is he absolutely certain that there isn't any room for brood at all? Or had he just looked at a few frames? It's hard to tell. I doubt there's much you can do now at this stage. Um, I, I mean, if the colony, if there's uh, plenty of bees in the colony, I don't think there'd be any problem. I, but they will remove it in the springtime. They'll have no problem removing it uh, once you get into uh, March. Maybe Roger would kind of add to that for maybe... I, I don't know where this beekeeper is from, but uh, <laughs> sorry. Oh yeah, sorry, sorry, yeah, sorry. Um, so that I mean the spring probably started a bit earlier there. So uh, yeah, there's no problem dealing with it in the spring anyway. Maybe Roger. Can um, well, yeah, I'm only five or six miles from Surrey border, depending on where in where in Surrey they are. Unlike you, Owen, uh, we've only had um, ivy flow 
in my area for the last 15 years or so. I don't know why it didn't flow before then, but it certainly didn't. Um, so, uh, but it's not every year. Um, this year was actually quite good because we had some uh, some decent weather towards the end of the year. I'm a little bit concerned about how the beekeepers got in this position um, in the first place. Is it genuinely? Uh, they say said nectar and honey. I think from the um, thing, honey. nectar and honey. Nectar. Yeah, um, which tends to suggest that they haven't they haven't fed. I suspect they may well have done, um, but I, but I. I, I I really don't know. Um, we obviously haven't got Apis mellifera mellifera or not pure ones in this area. So they're probably a bit sort of um, mongrelized or one of the uh, one of the imports that um, where the queens are quite uh, prolific. If that's the case, as soon as the ivy started coming in, I would have expected the queen to have started laying uh, again. Um, which these um, uh, exotic races tend tend to do. Um, if it's as jam packed as um, as uh, it, it appears, I'd be a little bit worried because uh, if there's a cold spell, the bees can't actually get their heads in, in, in into the cells and can't cluster properly. Um, so I will I will be concerned about that. Um, no disrespect to the question of but i'm wondering if they've um actually got the situation um uh, quite correct because i i if if there's no brood there with food coming in i would be concerned about the the the, the, the queen um because um she may well have failed um i think it needs on a warm day i think i'd have a look at it there certainly ought to be a few uh, a, a few eggs there, um, and it might just be that you've got to start thinking about um, uh, uniting. Um, or it's it's just one of those things, Owen, that I think you probably actually got to look at the colony. Um, if there's if it's uh, as you suggest, ivy honey, I would expect all the colonies to be in the same same condition, not just one of them. Um, now, if it's only one of them. It, could tend to suggest that it's a, a beginner beekeeper. And I'm wondering if they've done what everybody tends to do these days is feed, feed and feed and feed until they don't, um, uh, won't take any more. And I think that's probably not good, um, not good advice. I think I'd need to, to, to have a look at it. Mm. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question, um, I'll open this to either of you because I don't know what experience you'll have of this is, um, can you explain what checkerboarding is? Checkerboarding. I, 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 I didn't know until about an hour ago. <laughs> and then luckily I had a sneak preview of some of the questions. And uh, checkerboarding is an American, I think, developed in Tennessee. So basically it's a swarm a prevention uh, or swarm delay technique. So what you do is you're basically fooling the bees into thinking that there's you know, that there is still loads of room for them to store their honey and that they, they shouldn't be pre preparing to swarm. Now, unbeknownst to myself, I've actually been practicing this method for years, a variation of this method. And um, so in, in the classic system, what they do is that you, when you're putting on your empty super of drawn frames, what you do is you uh, say the, the super that's over the brood box, you take out every second frame of that and replace it with a drawn comb. And then obviously you do that with the, with the super you're putting on. So every second frame is drawn. Now, what I do is actually, and this is to do it because I used to have a lot of problems. We get a bit of oil seed rape around here, but it's very unpredictable. I never know when I have it. So I could have, have um, frames when I go to harvest, uh, to extract my honey, I could have quite a bit of crystallized honey that I wasn't expecting. So it would break your heart to be cutting out wired frames. So I saw there's a guy in Devon used the system and he basically, rather than using foundation uh, for new frames, what he did is he just stuck in the empty frame, frames in between two drawn frames. And that's what I do ever since. And I do it as a matter of practice now. So when I'm putting on new frames, they already have those gaps in between the drawn comb. And as I always believe, you know, it's a very, it's a 
very inexpensive way of reusing frames. But it also, I also felt that it had a great way, um, role to play in reducing the swarming urge. And I always, always believe that's the fact that you're providing bees with loads of opportunity to um, build wax, uh, which I think does seem to play a role in reducing um, swarming urge. But it could be, I just, just there a while ago, I came across this and I said, this could be like, this year, I would say about 8% of my colonies attempted to swarm. Um, and generally it would be like, uh, it would generally be under 20, 30% uh, at most would attempt to swarm. And I have, I mean, I have, uh, I'm a commercial beekeeper. These would be big, huge colonies in terms of, you know, as big as they get for AMM with like, you know, five, six supers on top. Uh, and uh, they, they don't, you know, are, are, are they're very slow to go into swarming mode. And maybe this is it because I'm using unbeknownst to myself, I was using this checkerboard method, um, the, the, a variation of it at least anyway. You know? So um, that's, well, that's from my experience anyway. That, that's, and, and as I said, I didn't know I was using this until recently. Maybe Roger would add to that again. Yeah, I've, I've never used it myself, but I do get a lot of questions about it during, during the summer. Um, and I think it's people who have heard about it, but, um, uh, haven't spoken to anybody who's actually used it. I've spoken to several beekeepers in the States, and I think this basically came from the southern states. Tennessee, and, yeah. Yeah, and I think it needs to be done when if you've got um, if you've got a heavy early flow, there's no point doing it if you haven't got a flow, because then you're not doing what uh, Owen says, you're really falling the bees. Um, but in, in case people haven't understood what Owen meant. Basically, if you take a, um, uh, a super of uh, empty comb, put it above the existing one, and then every other one you swap over so that you've got, um, you've got in each box um, uh, full, empty, full, empty, all the way across, and you've got exactly the same in the uh, top box, but one frame out. Mm. So, so that you're checkerboard in both ways, if you get what I mean. Um, I've never done it. Um, I don't think I'll ever do it, but I can't see really the difference between that really and um, uh, just putting your empty supers underneath because you're still creating the, the space. And I think it's a human thing that you're falling the bees into thinking that they, uh, they haven't got in, in, enough stalls um, uh, for the winter, but I uh, I don't know. <laughs> it's certainly been done a long time. I mean, there's one man I think by the name of Walter Wright, I think, who's 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 got credit for it. But if you go back into older books, um, you'll you'll you you'll find it. It was sort of what way way before the war, and I think he's just popularised it. So that's uh, that's all. Whether it's um, whether it would suit in the more marginal areas or not, I don't know. I, I, I suspect it probably wouldn't. Well, I think it was, I mean, it was obviously designed, as you said, for the southern states where they have big, big colonies yeah, of big bees flows. and big flows and a different climate. Um, and I wouldn't, I mean, I would never have used this system only for a totally different reason. And mine isn't a, like, is only, only a slight. So I wouldn't actually really advocate this, the system you know, uh, you know, um, for everybody, uh, and and it's something you'd have to try out yourself. You know, as you said, putting putting um, your drawn comb underneath, supering under. Um, you, I can't imagine why that would should be any different. You know, um, you know, to, to to the bees. You know, um, I, you know, you think that they would see that they're, and I actually do that occasionally. You know, I, I normally, because I have a lot of supers on and, you know, I, I'll super on, add my new super on top because I'm not going to take off all the supers every time. And you can just open the crown board and look in and see if you need a super or not. But occasionally, if there's a colony that I think is just on borderline with, with going into swarming mode, I would put the super on underneath um, straight over the queen excluder. You know? yeah. Oh, and when, when I've spoken to... Uh, American beekeepers, they insist that you must do it several weeks before it's it, 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 even swarming time. Um, you, you've got to do it when the early nectar comes in, which 
we don't get. Yeah, but we get a bit of willow, we get a bit of dandelion and those sort of things, but not the early uh, forage that some of these um, uh, people are getting in the southern states of America, where you're talking about sort of February. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they would be, yeah, exactly. They would be getting strong flows in February. So they would be everything I read about, yeah. that, I read about it saying early, it has to be done early, you know, uh, yeah. in preparation for, you know. So oh, in, with your method of, of slotting uh, and then framing <laughs> yeah. with two drawn ones, do you ever get a problem with the bees drawing out the frames on either side too deep? Yeah, well, so if you use manly, if you use manly, you won't. But if you use Hoffman, you can. If you use Hoffman frames, because they're narrower, they will often draw them out, uh, draw the, yeah, the ones in between, in between. But when you use manly, it's very rarely that happens, that they will actually. And, you, and your hives have to be level. It's important that your hives are level so that they'll draw the comb down straight. You know. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, the next one is an age-old argument, and that's uh, your thoughts on poly versus wood. Oh, we... <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. I, I use wooden hives because that's how I started. I have nothing. I have no ideological problem with polystyrene hives. Um, I, I've never. I, I have a few polystyrene uh, roofs that I inherited, or sorry, polystyrene supers that I inherited. Um, but I don't. I, I, I like. I've seen people with polystyrene hives. I think it's really important in in our climate anyway. If you're using polystyrene hives, ventilation really, really is very important. Like you know, uh, because the you know, the, the, a lot of people think you know during the winter, uh, it's it, you know it's about keeping the bees warm. Well, it isn't really. You know, the bees have plenty of. Uh, plenty of food and they're in a good location the hive is, is well made then you know coal is not the problem it's it's you know it's dampness especially if you're in ireland or the west of ireland definitely dampness will become so ventilation so if you're polystyrene hive ventilation is really important um, i actually started using polystyrene roofs actually and i find them brilliant they're really good uh does uh, get them and they're they're a kind of a deep roof so uh, you know I would use open mesh floors, so um, I would then use uh, need insulation in the roof. So when you get a polystyrene roof, it's already insulated. So I use that. But ideologically, I've, I've no problem between um, using polystyrene house. I don't know what Roger thinks. Um, well, I, I have to say, I personally don't like them. Um, the full hives, I've never had uh, myself. I've, I've always had wood. Um, but I've handled a lot of uh, a lot of colonies in polystyrene hives, and I just I just don't like them there. Um, those that I've come across, the uh, the material is very soft, and it's so easy to uh, uh, to damage. And if you've got um, the boxes um, properized uh, together, like they, like they can do, if you go and separate them, what I found is um, that it actually um, uh, pulls apart the the polystyrene. Um, also, I found it difficult to, to to clean propolis off, and for some reason, bees seem to love polystyrene, um, uh, propolising polystyrene more than uh, more than wood. It might just be that perhaps wood is a lot easier to clean. You can just uh, scrape scrape it with your hive tool. Um, what I have had quite a bit of experience of, in fact, a lot of experience, is uh, poly nukes, um, which, I, which I don't like. Um, at, Whisp at the Whisper Green Teaching April, we've had um, 10 of each two different manufacturers. I won't mention the manufacturers because that, that's unfair. Uh, so 20 um, poly nukes. And I found them, or we have found them, so much of a problem that we've, um, we've just uh, given them up. Uh, one of the main problems with them is that the floors seem to be uh, too deep, much too deep. Uh, so you get that um, uh, uh, build up underneath the bottom bar of the frame and bees uh, tend to do all sorts of things like hide queen cells and that sort of thing um, in there. Whereas on a shallow floor, they don't do that. Um, I've, um, overwintered about equal amounts of the last 10 years, um, equal amounts of these poly ones and wood. And I personally don't find uh, much difference, if any, in the strength of the nukes coming through, through the winter. Um, so um, we have uh, actually changed them over this year, back, back everything to wood. Um, 
But that Can I have my first disagreement with Roger tonight. <laughs> I, oh, that's I'm fine. Huge, yeah. I'm a huge fan of I'm a huge fan of polystyrene uh, nukes. Huge fan of them. Um, I find them very easy to use. Uh, I find them, uh, you know, very easy to transport, uh, and I, I find it very easy to clean. I use um, what to use. Uh, it's um, oven cleaner on them, I think, which is potassium hydroxide solution, and uh, that will uh, dissolve off the okay. polystyrene but without harming polystyrene. I, I do think you're right about the quality of polystyrene. It varies a lot, and I know there's one producer of polystyrene hives which are absolutely excellent, uh, but I know others that are absolutely terrible. And as you said, they're very soft, and they're just the hive tool just eats into them, like you know. Um, but I do, I do, I do love the um, polystyrene. Well, the particular brand that I use, uh, I do like the polystyrene nukes. You know? um, and, and the one advantage, of course, of polystyrene, though, is for beekeepers who are getting older, um, is that much lighter, incredibly light. I know one beekeeper uh, who w wouldn't be that strong, but she uses uh, uh, mostly polystyrene supers, and it really makes a huge difference because a wooden, a wooden super by itself. Uh, can weigh a fair bit like a wooden super by itself you know it's maybe 10 pounds or close to 10 pounds weight you know uh, so using polystyrene super seems to um, work very well for her but I, do, I agree with you that the quality polystyrene varies an awful lot between the different brands and so do the designs of them because some of them yeah. are incompatible with others and incompatible with wood yeah yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it, it's good that we have, have a discussion because, um, you know, then people can um, uh, make their own mind, minds up. But certainly polystyrene hives is, is almost as um, uh, good for creating, let's say, discussion than the, uh, the matchsticks underneath ground boards. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, super. Um Next one. Uh, this one's an interesting one. Um, I'll share the question with you. Um, uh, it's come from somebody in South Yorkshire, but that's not why, uh, why we're asking it. Um, it says, after removing full supers, I normally extract fil and filter the honey within hours of removal. <laughs> the empty supers are replaced the same evening. Some, uh, some days later, I bottle it in sterilised jars. Not long after, the honey will start to crystallise and go lighter in colour. This makes it more difficult to sell uh, just on appearance alone. Is he doing anything wrong? Is there anything that uh, can be improved? Uh, Owen, I know that you sell an awful lot of honey. Uh, have you got any tips? Uh, first of all, uh, there's nothing wrong with honey. I mean, you know, uh, almost all honey is crystallised. So, you know, and this is the beginner's... You know, they have to realize this, you know, so, I mean, honey crystallizes, like, there's no mention there that honey has been warm. So if you do it uh, all at room temperature, it will crystallize, and some honey is crystallized very rapidly. Uh, you know, the best thing is to cream it, and I think there's a huge market for creamed honey in, in, in Britain, and not, not so much in Ireland, but definitely you could cream it if they didn't want to warm it up. But if you're... Um, if you want it to uh, stay runny and clear, you do have to warm it to a certain degree. You know, you're obviously being very careful uh, because you warm it um, and that will keep it, um, uh, you know, clarify it and keep it warm for, for much longer periods. But, you know, honey, pure honey will, uh, will, will crystallize very rapidly. You know, not, sorry, not very rapidly, but all good honey, pure honey will crystallize. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this sounds to me as if they're talking about the early crop, not the late crop. So it could be icy, could be icy rain. Yeah. 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 If that is the case, Owen, would you sort of blend it and um, uh, and cream it? Well, you're not. We don't call it cream it these days. We we uh, soft set. Soft set. That. Yeah. Uh, I don't generally because there's no market for for soft set. Very little market for soft set honey in Ireland. Amazingly, uh, except for ivy. I, there's a great market now for soft set ivy honey. But uh, generally, you know, uh, well, there is a small market in some places, but it's a lot of work. So generally, no, I would, I would mix it in small proportions with my normal honey, um, and uh, you know, I'd warm it up and then mix it with the other honey, and mm -hmm. then, you know, it, 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 it'd be diluted so much that it's not going to be a major problem with regard to crystallization. I'm wondering about the comment. Didn't they say it looked? Uh... 
it didn't look nice. I think they just said it turned light and cloudy, which you'd expect if it was crystallizing. Oh, yeah. It, yeah. It ah, ah, are they thinking about frosting? Um, I don't know. Well, if, if it's light, it, it might, they might be talking about frosting. Uh, it just says that um, uh, go, it, and go lighter in colour. Yeah. It doesn't go lighter in colour. Well, uh, generally, when, when honey crystallises, it goes lighter in colour anyway. <laughs> Yeah, but I, I, I think, Owen, they might mean white. frosting. Yeah. White frosting down the side. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. yeah. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure, Roger, but uh, yeah, but maybe you could add, I, don't, I wouldn't know, as I said, I don't do uh, much soft set honey, so you might know more about that. Yeah. Um, well, so a soft set honey is no problem with you. Obviously, um, I can't dis um, discuss it uh, at uh, here, um, but I, I think we're, we're looking at frosting, which which is a, which is a natural uh, phenomenon, isn't it, really. Yeah, yeah. It, it could be. I don't know now. You know. Okay, so um, this uh, type of question <laughs> has been uh, in the media uh, quite recently. What should we do about? <laughs> adulterated or fake honey. Go on, Roger. That's a good reaction. Off you go. Well, right. Uh, uh, how long have we got? Uh, well, the question is, what should we do? Um, well, I think probably it might be just worth uh, explaining a little bit to people what the, what the issue is. Although adulteration has been a problem um, uh, for a very long time, um, there are a lot of issues at the moment and in Apimondia in Montreal in 2019, there were big presentations on, um, uh, on fake honey and adulteration. Now, it, it, it does both. Um, and um, the figure they came up with was that 40% of the honey on the world market is fake. And I can't remember the figures, but the honey show there um, there, I think, were over half the exhibits withdrawn because they, uh, they didn't pass the tests. Um, now, there's a German company that's got some fairly sophisticated uh, equipment that can detect the different sorts of sugars. Um, and what they tend to use are things like um, um, rice sugar and corn, um, uh, rice syrup and corn, uh, uh, corn syrup. And dress it up to look like um uh, to look like honey um and uh, obviously the uh, uh, the consumer is being um, well it's fraud it's 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 out and out fraud um so that's basically what it is now 40 percent is a huge amount you've probably heard the stories about um, manuka honey manuka honey call it what you like um that there are huge amounts sold compared to the amount that's uh, that's produced that of course is another one that is being done purely on cost but i think in general the um the the uh, uh, the lower value uh, honeys is probably because of shortage of uh, of supply now um you might think well okay we're only uh, amateur beekeepers or fairly amateur beekeepers so, so sorry i didn't mean to <laughs> Uh, no, Not mean no. to be disrespectful, but no. um, you know, at, at, at our sort of level, um, it is not going to be an issue. What I think is going to be an issue, and nobody's really picked up on uh, at the moment, is the public's confidence in in honey. Um, and if somebody really does get hold of this, then it could, I think, mean um, uh, problems for uh, sales. Um, it's clearly a massive problem, and I asked a question in the um, in one of the um, presentations in Apimondia, and the question I asked was: This um, uh, equipment is fairly sophisticated. Um, there are uh, some uh, countries, and um, probably uh, the UK being uh, one of them, um, where they probably wouldn't take it uh, too seriously, and. Um, uh, they, there wouldn't be so many checks. Is it, is it likely that uh, the honey will be diverted from the countries who've got the greater checks in to our country? 
And um, there was uh, the chairman there and there were about six people on the panel and uh, the chairman refused to have the question answered. So, and he, 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 he closed, closed the session down. Um, so I, I, I guessed from that, that there is, um, there's a lot more to it than we, uh, we, we make it. But I think it's just, uh, uh, well, not just, but it's a case of confidence that it's going to be the, the, the big issue at the end of the day. Yeah, I mean, uh, everything, I mean, uh, um, it is a major problem. I mean, when I go into my local supermarket and, uh, you know, my honey is there and I see this, uh, this other honey, often with Irish sounding names, actually, um, and it is selling for one third or occasionally on a special deal at one quarter the price of my own. And now I know damn well how much work I have to do and my fees have to do to get that. Um, and even the case of even when honey is not being adulterated, there is the problem, uh, like, um, there is a, a certain um, fair trade issue too. I mean, I know um, I know a friend of mine who uh, went to Argentina and met a lot of beekeepers there. And basically, they, what happened was the big, big first world honey packers were going down there. And basically, you know, they would pay them a pittance for their honey. So the beekeepers there were not being encouraged to look after the bees like in any way, kind of uh, in terms of um, animal health and all that and, and and look after their products. So it was kind of an exploitation of the beekeepers. Whereas if there was an element of fair trade in, 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 in that uh, honey, you know, where they could get a proper price for their honey, you know, this. so the whole world market is, I mean, there is a, I think it's on Netflix, there's a documentary detailing the whole, scandalous nature of it like you know and it is i mean when i mean i think supermarkets and packers have a role to play here because when they can sell buy honey at such a low rate and sell it they you know it, it can't you know talking to the beekeeper it can't possibly be possible to produce real honey at that price you know even in third world countries you know um, so you know what what do you I mean, what can you do about it? I mean, definitely, and national governments should be doing more. I mean, you know, we get, we get as a commercial beekeeper, I get inspected by our Department of Agriculture and my, you know, and my label would be um, examined to fix in with the um, EU standards and all that. Uh, and, you know, you, you wonder then when the packers, you know, their honey is tested, uh, obviously they're only looking for a, a, a small number of criteria that, you know, that they have to it's an emotive issue, yeah, and I know, as Roger said, you could spend all night talking about that. It's one issue. About three, uh, about three years, four years ago now, uh, Owen, at uh, Gormanston, uh, the late Philip McCabe, who was at that point president of um, uh, Epimondia, uh, he gave a talk on this, mm. <laughs> and um, he, he showed screenshots of um, uh, advertisements, uh, rice syrup uh, for making honey. And uh, you know it, it, it's it's it is it, it, wide open. Yeah, I mean, I, I was talking to Philip as well. Like I, Philip only lived for a few miles from me here, and like I, I, I remember him one telling me once that you could. There's a I won't mention the country, but there's a, a, a company in this country that you all you, they need to do is send them the specs on the color of the of the honey, the specific gravity, um, various you know ash quantity whatever in it and they would make up something that would resemble it exactly you know in their in their factory so yeah it's a big business honey adulteration is a big business uh next question then is from uh, somebody in northern ireland uh, what is the best way to build up a weaker colony at different times of the year the best way to build up a weaker colony at different times of the year uh owen yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's right. It, it does depend on the time of year, uh, you know, very much so. So, I mean, if you're building, first of all, if you're building up a week, there's no point building up a weaker colony until you know why it is weak. You know, yep. if it is a problem, having a problem with disease or a failing queen, uh, then, you know, it's, it's not worth your while uh, tr trying to build it up. Um, but if you're satisfied, like sometimes you might have a colony comes out of the winter in poor condition through one thing, like last um Last spring, we had a horrific spring um, last uh, last spring, uh, and uh, colon, a lot of colonies came through fairly okay, and then, but not one just barely scraped through. But my 
belief is that if a colony has a queen, then it can be rescued. Like once there's a queen, I've often rescued a colony with a queen and uh, just a handful of bees because a queen is worth her weight of gold at that, that time of year because you want an opportunity to produce another one for several months. Um, so I think the, at the beginning of the year, the biggest problem is the lack of bees. You need to add bees to, to the colony because there's no point adding brood because there isn't enough, uh, enough um, bees in the, you know, say the recipient colony to, uh, to keep that um, brood viable and warm and, and, and you know. Uh, so you, what you need to do is add bees. And there's, what I do is, um, uh, you know, there's one, and it's a well-known thing, and uh, it's, you know, when you swap two hives, you can swap, um, you know, a weak hive and a strong hive. I generally tend, to, I don't generally tend to swap if it's a weak hive and, um, and, and a medium, good medium strength hive. Um, and what that does, and now I would always cage the queen in that case, because generally you'll find that the flying bees, so you're basically you're moving, you know, uh, hive A to the site of site of hive B, and you're moving hive B to the site of hive A. So all the flying bees from the strong colony go into the, into the weaker colony. Um, and now I, I say I cage the queen because those bees are accepted perfectly and generally there is no fighting in there because the bees, you know, arriving back in, presume they're going into the right hive. Um, bees, I think, are often very honest that way. They presume, you know, they won't question if that's if they're, a different hive is on their site. They presume it was theirs. Uh, but occasionally, uh, you know, if you have a foraging bee coming in, it might come across the queen and not and straight away, you know, the nose may be a different order. So I put her in the queen just to get, put the queen in the cage just to allow them to normalize. The thing is in early in the spring as well, these foraging brings are bringing in pollen, loads and loads of pollen. And that's what the wheat colony needs to try and get um, the um, uh, queen up and lay and going uh, and building up. And I find that works very well. It works, uh, you know, I think it works about 95% of the time. Um, and then, you know, later on in the year, uh, when the weather uh, starts to improve and colonies get a bit bigger, you can actually transfer frames of brood. Obviously, you know, you never, you always look at the frame of brood, transferring from one to the other to make sure that there's no sign of any kind of brood disease or anything on it. And um, generally I would find, I would do a certain amount of equalization where I would take frames out of my stronger colonies and move them across the weaker colonies, uh, you know, about one every two weeks for the weak colonies, uh, and that builds them up. Uh, and it slows down the strong colonies as well. Uh, it means that they don't go into flowering mode too soon. Um, what stage would that frame be at that you would be moving over? Would it be always, I would always move uh, sealed brood because obviously sealed brood doesn't need to be fed by the weaker colony. So it doesn't, all they need to do is keep it warm. So they don't have to expend resources trying to feed the larvae. So I've, I'd, I would, you know, try and uh, move across, um, you know, a good frame of sealed brood. Um, so that, and they will be hatching out fairly soon to add to the, uh, to the population of the colony. Roger? Right. Um, I don't think I could add uh, too much to that because it does um, make a lot of difference what, to, what, what, what time of year it is. Um, <clears throat> I wonder why Owen wouldn't um, um, use a, a weak colony and, um, and a medium-sized colony um, because I've often found that what you can do is if you've got the, um, uh, the weak colony, if you bring a medium colony to each side of it, um, get, get the bees flying, flying there and then move both of them away, you end up with quite a lot of lot of bees in the in, in the wheat colony, and what you're not doing is denuding um, the, uh, the 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 stronger colonies. Um, but on the on the other hand, uh, sometimes you can get over a potential swarming problem from a strong colony by taking the um, the weaker uh, uh, taking the flying bees off it. Okay, it might only delay the, the swarm in a, a week or two, but it's uh, it's well worth uh, uh, giving it a crack. <clears throat> um, if I think you need to look at the colony, if your current brood is fairly well covered with bees, then you can do a, quite a lot more than if it's sparsely populated. If it's sparsely populated, it's probably either lost adult bees for one reason or another or the queen has tried to expand um, when the conditions aren't, uh, aren't, 
aren't really very good. Um, <clears throat> later in the season, you've got a, a, a different situation. Um, if perhaps a nuke is made up in July, just for argument's sake, um, what you can do is take sealed brood away from strong colonies um, because that's not going to be any good to them. And I mean sealed brood, not um, not um, not partial or uh, unsealed brood. And don't forget the frame of uh, brood when it emerges, you get three frames of bees. So if perhaps you make up a a, a nuke in in in, in June, um, then you can bolster that up well strong enough to overwinter um, simply by using the brood from the other the other colonies. But um, Owen mentioned um, putting it in every couple of weeks. That's that's about right, I think, because uh, brood is sealed for twelve days, and um, that I think will will um, work, uh, work work quite well. Um, I would definitely agree with him about caging the queen. If you've got bees from a strong colony going into a weaker colony, I would um, I would always always cage the queen. You you can, but on the other hand, you can. Um, uh, it's surprising what you can get away with in a nectar flow. Sorry, uh, yeah, Riley. Sorry, I meant the point about uh, swapping. Uh, why I don't use a strong colony? I just found sometimes when you use a very this is like in uh, like in early uh, kind of spring, like uh, end of March, beginning of April. Oh, sometimes right, yeah. I found that if you use a strong colony, a strong colony will have more foragers and um, a huge amount of forage as a proportion of the population. You know? And I find that it just uh, like the amount of bees is huge and it just makes it. I prefer more gradual. I, I only did, I mean, generally, when I say medium strength, I mean kind of like not my strongest one, but maybe the next one after that, you know, or uh, not, you know, not, I don't think uh, it makes much difference really. Um, but sometimes I find when you have very strong colonies, it can flood the weak colony with a yeah. huge amount of bees, um, and it, which is not a major problem, but it just means it can be, you <laughs> come back and just, uh, just chuck them out. One thing we haven't discussed is the district, because some districts are, are very early and others are, are, are very late, and you probably do different uh, different things. This is one of the problems with a, uh, um, a sort of event like this, or even books or um, magazines or, or the, uh, the internet. Um, if people are given advice, it makes quite a difference as, as, as to the, um, the, the, their location. Uh, sorry, I just in passing, there's just another even in, in say at harvest time. I uh, say if you want to strengthen, you have a couple of weakish colonies, or say, you know, for instance, there might be a queen who was a bit slow going into lay and there was a big long brood gap and whatever, and there might be, or there might be a nuke you want to strengthen up. If when you're clearing, if you're, I actually, when I'm clearing my bees, um, I would take uh, bees from the underneath the clear board from the strong colonies. And uh, you can shake those into nukes then, um, or, or weak hives, and they're readily accepted, no problem accepted. And it's a good way in, in, the, in the autumn time of just maybe adding a few bees to um, some weak colonies before you go into the winter. You know? Great, thank you very much. Uh, so the next one is uh, from somebody in Dublin, in Ireland. Um, are there any practical steps that we can take individually and collectively to realistically prevent hybridization of the native Irish bee? Uh, I suppose I'll take that one. Um, I mean, and this is applicable to anywhere where there's, where there's native yeah. bees, native, you know, native Welsh bees, native English bees, native Scottish bees. Um, yeah, hybrid, like, so if you're talking practical steps, if you're a single a beekeeper by yourself, I mean, one thing is, um, and you have good bees yourself, assuming you have good, black bees yourself well try you could try and flood the area with drones <clears throat> is one a good step um you know and we don't we don't produce we don't allow our colonies to produce enough drones anyway i mean uh, you know uh, uh they, you know in the wild they would produce a uh, fair i can't remember the proportion but quite a lot of drones so you know it's it's important that you give them that opportunity and i would like in in good colonies i would you know, uh, may, give them extra room. Like, and all I would do is I would uh, say if there was, if there was a brood frame that was getting a little bit tired, um, and, and not quite black or anything, but a bit tired. Or, you know, sometimes you know the, the, at the bottom of the it can get a bit uh, stale. 
I would just use a sharp knife to just cut across and leave an empty space and I'll fill that with um, drone brood. And yeah, you can flood, so if you have good bees, you flood the area with, with um, drones. Um, also, it's important, um, you know, uh, supplying native queens. A good, if there's a good supply of native queens, then there's going to be less likely that people will, you still have people going to import, but it's going to be less likely. And we're, we're looking now in recent years that we have a lot of suppliers. But, you know, the thing is a lot of ordinary beekeepers, you know, they don't go into breeding, but you don't have to be, you know, uh, breed a lot of queens to, to, to uh, propagate your bees. You know, I mean, if you do, every time you do an artificial swarm, like that's an extra, you know, so it's easy enough to, I mean, and, you know, past those, even queen cells, like queen cells is a way of passing along queen cells to other beekeepers and needs, needs lot, not a lot of work, you know, uh, if you're good bees. Other than that, like your know, breeding groups work really well. Um, and NIBS, uh, Native Irish Honey Society, this year ran a very successful program where they were kind of sponsored a lot of breeding groups around the country. And they had way too many applications actually, but they still managed, I can't remember, it was about maybe a dozen or new breeding groups that they took under their wing and they've been very successful and just give ordinary beekeepers a way of producing a few queens for themselves. So, but working in a group works really well. Um, uh, and then after that, it's just, you know, getting the message out, you know, uh, as much as possible. Like it, we're looking in Ireland, like, you know, journey surveys show that about 90% of Irish beekeepers want to or do keep uh, black bees, you know, um, and or, or have an aspiration to do so if they, if they can't, you know. We're very lucky that way, but there is still, you know, the, there is still problems with a few people um, wanting to import and uh, that, that can uh, as cause the hybridization problems. You know? um, Roger? Um, yeah, I, I, I think you've, um, uh, you've hit it on, on, on the head, really. Um, but I do wonder, um, bearing in mind the, um, the question of coming from Northern Ireland, if they weren't... Uh, Dublin, I think. Ask, Dublin. Oh, sorry, I was Dublin. Oh, right. Sorry, I was thinking Belfast. Yeah, okay. Um, anyway, it's um, it's uh, certainly further up, a lot, lot nearer the border than mo most of them are. I'm wondering if it was provoked by the um, the importation into Northern Ireland of the uh, well-known uh, packages. Um, uh, if so, it'd, it'd be a bit a bit of be a bit of a pity. Um, but I think probably if people didn't uh, use imported um, uh, bees and queens, then um, they would, I think, um, uh, morph back in m into more the native bee than um, uh, than they are at the moment. Because certainly, a lot of the imports that I see in um, in in managed colonies, I never ever see them in the in a free living colony mm. if they've been there over one winter. They just don't survive. Mm. So I think probably they would, um, if um, I'm not saying imports banned, but if people didn't use them. I think um, it will be a, a better um, a, a better situation, um, but they've got it much better in Ireland than we have in uh, uh, in uh, in England because they've got much better stock to start with. Um, uh, in England, it's very very variable. Uh, yeah, I mean you're, that point about you saying that the bees will improve. I mean that is really true. Uh, you know, there was uh, imports into Ireland were banned, I think, in, uh, I think, 89, or uh, let me see, I'm trying to think now, I think about 89 until for about maybe eight years, uh, they were banned in time because of Varroa. And in that time period, even in areas where there was no bee improvement done, the bees naturally reverted yeah. to the native, you know, um, and even, I mean, back in the 70s, 70s, uh, there was a lot of Italian bees brought into Ireland, like you know, and you wouldn't see it afterwards. You didn't see a sign of them. They all disappeared. They're, even their 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 DNA trace practically almost disappeared uh, because they didn't have genes for surviving, like in, in the Irish. Well, surviving an Irish summer, never mind an Irish winter. You know? We had exactly the same issue in straight after the 62, 63 winter, a really hard winter, um, when I first started keeping bees. Um, a lot of people were importing these bright yellow jobs that look, look, looked a bit like this, and um, they they just did not last. 
Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll uh, just show you the next question because uh, it's a bit of a long one. Uh, I've had three incidents of <laughs> Queen rejection last season. In all cases, the Queen was united via a nuke uh, after uh, laying for about a month. The recipient colonies were all hopelessly queenless for about three weeks as being used as a soul raiser or a uh, failed queen mating with only a little seal brood. A test comb added to first check for queenlessness as well. Um, all were united over newspaper, two colonies. The queen was slowly released for a pushing cage. The recipient colonies allowed the queen to start laying, but then killed the queen once that they had uh, the material to make queen cells and raise their own. Uh, races were similar, so dark bees. What did uh, what did I do wrong? Uh, how can I improve acceptance for next season? Um, Roger, Roger should take that, yeah. that expert on queen, queen <laughs> uh, Let's take the bottom line. What did I do wrong? Absolutely nothing. Um, how can I improve acceptance next season? Difficult. Um, this is one of several problems that I've been trying to highlight since about the turn of the um, uh, uh, turn of the century. And I've written a page about it on uh, Dave Cushman's website. And um, uh, it's one of three things that are happening um, regularly. Um, queens either disappearing, <laughs> uh, being superseded very soon after um, uh, getting mated and um, failing soon after being mated. No longer do we get queens that live four, five, six years Sometimes if you're going into the second year, you're incredibly uh, lucky. Um, now, there is, um, in my experience, there is quite a reasonable chance if you've mated a queen in a mini nuke, that you then put her in straight into a full colony and um, very often the supersedure cells go up very, very quickly. Usually, if you just take those down, everything settles down. My guess is, but I don't know, that um, if you take a queen out of a uh, uh, take a queen out of a colony, it's laying fine, and then there's one that's not laying very well. The bees seem to think, "Hang on, we've got a problem here," and uh, go to superseder. Once she gets up to speed, there's no problem. I don't mean that, and I think the key is that they've um, all lasted about a month. I've had ever so many of these uh, as well. And don't think people who um, buy queens don't have the same problem as well. Very often, I think they um, they're told just to uh, just to leave them to settle down, and uh, they supersede without them knowing. And I think that's what um, uh, that's what usually happens. So, in answer to the to the the last part of the question, you've done absolutely nothing wrong. Um, don't go beating yourself up. Um, because, um, every, well, not everybody, but a lot of other people are, who are noticing what's happening with their bees are having exactly the same um, exactly the same problem. But look on Cushman's website for queen problems, and um, uh, you'll probably recognise what I've written there. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree with, um, with Roger. I mean, I remember working with my father's bees back in the 70s and 80s, and queen, prob queen problems wasn't you know it was a rare rare problem rare, you yeah. know it was amazing we didn't appreciate at the time how easy queens were, you know colonies replaced queens themselves and, and that like but definitely it has become a major problem um and it's very inconsistent it's very unpredictable in, in my experience uh, like in this case and like it's all with one hive you know you kind of kind of think you know is that particular hive is causing a problem for some reason you know uh, the reaction between the bees and the queen coming in, whether, you know, so the problem uh, could be the queens or it could be the, uh, the bees themselves uh, are just not accepting her. But uh, it, it's, you know, there's some things in beekeeping you just have to cut your losses and, and, and give up. I mean, and, and I mean, as Roger said, if you're introducing a new queen, always come back after a week after you start laying just to check that there's no, yep. you, know, you haven't tried to supersede her, just as a matter of form. Uh, because as you said, it could, they might raise the queen cells, you remove, tear them down, and, and then that's fine. She's got, got over that hump uh, that she needs to, to get going. Um, but I think, and I think like there's a lot of, you know, this 
queens disappearing. The queen problems, like, sometimes you just have to shrug your shoulders because you don't know what's going on sometimes, you know, and even though you're very experienced uh, over the years, sometimes you just don't know what's happening, you know, and, um, you know, that, um, with, with your queens. And definitely queens, uh, the, the length of life of queens, you know, they, they were, used to live much longer, you know, our chance of queen going into fourth, fifth year was much greater. I mean, I have had one queen, let's say, in the last three or four years, it's gone to four years. Um, and that's an exception, like, you know. Right. Um, and, uh, like, generally, a lot of them are replaced after a year uh, mm. you know, by the bees themselves, which you wouldn't expect it to, to be, you know. Um, but so, you know. Uh, and, you know, and in this case, I'd say, the, you know, this this might never happen, this beekeeper again. You know, I don't think, as Roger said, he's doing anything wrong. It followed, you know, he did everything by the book. Uh, and it might, mightn't happen again for some time or, you know, but Owen, I've, I've had exactly the same thing happen. If um, it, it do that, so swarm control on a colony, leave a queen cell for that to emerge, um, and it's emerged in its own hive um, from the, the 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 same stock. And I've still had it happen, uh, and not just occasionally. This happens regularly, and I think some of the people who claim that it doesn't happen, I do wonder if they uh, how often they look at their. Uh, 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 the, the, the bees because uh, I go to people's hives and um, say we've well, got a queen problem oh, oh, however oh, uh, uh, they're, they're always doing that and I think one of the issues is that because it's been going on now for 20 years um, there's an awful lot of beekeepers that have come into beekeeping since then and that's been normal it's exactly the same as Varroa I know mean, myself were uh, lucky enough to, uh, uh, to be beekeeping pre-Varroa and it, it was an absolute joy then. It, it, mm. it, 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 it is quite enjoyable now, but not not yeah. what it was. Um, and but n- new people coming in, they just they, they accept it because that's all they know. Yeah, this is yeah. Excellent. Thank you for that. Uh, one to uh, really get you thinking. Then, uh, what percentage of genetic conformity do you suggest is a minimum? raising AMM queens, assuring, uh, assuming that the micro, my, mitochondria of the bloodstock is pure black. Bro, well, bro, I, bro. Can't, I, I can't even pronounce half of those words, so I'm, I can't help with this one. Uh, who wants to, have a, who wants to have a stab? Well, I'll start and Roger can carry on from there. Uh, the, my, well, the, the fact that my, my, that means that the queen, uh, the mitochondrial DNA is inherited through the female line only. So it might, you know, it means he's basically saying that the queen is black queen. Um, so, I mean, what percentage, like the things, the, you know, if you're analyzing, it depends how you're analyzing these bees. If these bees are being analyzed by DNA, then generally, you know, they work on, kind of 90% is regarded, you know, and that's an actual probability. So they kind of work out what's the probability that this is AMM. And if it is a 90% probability being AMM, then they consider it to be AMM. If it's not, then, you know, it's, it's, it's a near native, you know. Um, so uh, the thing is, so, I mean, you know, this beekeeper wants to breed as close to AMM as they can. It all depends if, I mean, France is very good, actually. There's a lot of good areas in France that have a very, um, very uh, pure AMM. So it depends where he, he or she is in France. Um, so it, it's difficult. Uh, I mean, you know, if you just want to breed to AMM, you do breed with the highest, you know, the highest genetic, you know, I mean, um, Result you that's if you're getting your bees analyzed bee DNA, but this is obviously not for every beekeeper. So the thing is, if you you would just otherwise you're just breeding, you breed like any normal breeding program, you breed from the best that you can do under your own circumstances. Whether that is, you know, if you're surrounded by a lot of other hybrids or even other uh, subspecies, then you might have to put up with um, uh, you know less pure bees, but you know. There's always some that are better than others, and you know. And mon- the thing is, how do you monitor this? You know, you could use morphometry, but morphometry is very hit and miss. Um, cubital index seems in, in Irish bee cubital index seems to work quite well, but then it seems to be 
uh, when the bees are very pure, you know, it keeps it in mix. Morphometry seems to work better, which kind of defeats the purpose of using it to work out how much hybridizing, hybridization it is. Uh, uh, but, you know, you can use things like color is a, it's not a brilliant guide, but it's better than 50%. Um, and then characteristics, characteristics of the bees that you're looking for, like, you know, the conservative brood nest, the overwintering, the, oh, there's various other ones, good cappings, like, so um, you can only breed with what you've got. And, and this is a big issue uh, as well, of course. I mean, when you're in areas where you don't have AMM available, you know, do you bring in AMM or do you just work with the best local one? And, and you know, this is an argument that's probably gone on for a while. And I, you know, if you're bees, and in parts of like recent results seems to be in parts of England and Wales and Scotland, the bees are actually still retain quite a lot of uh, AMM DNA uh, and uh, should be worked with, you know, uh, that there would be rather than, you know, in a way, it, there's no point bringing AMM bees from Ireland down into Sussex um, when you have, if you have bees that are reasonably, you know, have a certain amount of AMM genes in them that are already there. Uh, but this is, I mean, this is a big debate that's been on for a, a long time too. Um, so, Roger? Um, well, percentage was mentioned, which tends to suggest to me that the only way you'd um, find that out would be um, uh, DNA analysis, in which case I'm not really qualified to um, to give much to the um, uh, to the question. Really, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't really answer that. It's, uh... Yeah, I mean, well, if he wants to breed MM, basically, you know, it isn't recognised as being MM unless it's ninety percent. So, I mean, but that's only uh, you know, if he wants to breed. Yeah, but you're, you're involved with the scientists um, uh, basically all the time. I, I'm not, so I, oh, yeah, yeah. I, I haven't been able to feed off them. Yeah, so but my point being just like, uh, <clears throat> you, you know, uh, my point being is, is he's better off breeding, with, breeding from what the best he's got there, you know, rather than, um, you know, worrying. I mean, if he's surrounded by a lot of other uh, hybridization and other subspecies not going to get anywhere near 90% AMM. But so you just have to breed with what he's got the best of. Well, if, the, if they've got um, uh, good queens that they mm. know they're good, uh, they, they they could keep them for drone production. Yeah. But I mean, not, the drone, but, uh, and he said the drones will, will be good. You know? Yeah. Drones will be good and would you know spread the AMM genes around the place. Mm. Definitely, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Pat. Um, well, so, uh, we... I, I was going to say, I'm not sure we've answered the, the questioner's question, yeah. but sorry uh, about that. No, I think I think you've you've done the best that you can. Um, shall we try and get a couple more in? Uh, I, I, have, I do realise that it's uh, it's half past eight already, but shall we try and get a couple of quick uh, yeah. quick ones in first of all? So uh, this one: uh, Do queens uh, do orientation flights? Uh, the, the questioner has observed bees doing orientation flights, but uh, wonders, does the queen just go straight out and come back without having to do them, or how does that work? Um, well, my, uh, I mean, you know, um, I don't so, uh, think as per se she does the same kind of orientation flights as, as the workers do, but... Um, and often it's suspected for a long time that queens were very poor, uh, you know, or actually quite poor uh, flyers, like are, are at orienting. But actually, research has shown that if they're actually quite good at returning. If you have a lot of, say, mini nukes in an area, the queens, research from Germany has shown that they're very good at returning to the, the right on. But I think a lot of it too, when, when the queen's gone out in her first flight, so she often has, um, what's, this, what's this called, Roger? A mating swarm, which could yeah. be, you know, can vary, can vary quite a lot. I mean, I've seen a few of them that are quite big. You'd mistake them for um, a cast, uh, and they, I presume, help the, the queen orient, orientate. Uh, this person is also asking, she doesn't leave the hive. Well, I mean, no, she definitely mates in the air, um, and she will fly quite a distance, generally. Again, research, I think, in Austria has shown that the, um, that the queen generally... Um, Will fly to not not the nearest um, drone congregation area, but the next one after that. 
It depends, and obviously how many drone congregations are around the place. So she could, can travel quite a distance uh, before returning. Um, but I think I think I've come across where it said that, like in her initial flights, that uh, uh, and, and now she does go out. She does go out for little flights. She goes out. I mean, I've seen uh, other research from Macedonia, and it showed like she does go in and out of the quite a lot, and she might actually even go out fly the hive, but not go on a flight and go back in again. It wouldn't be kind of orient or orientation flights, uh, same as workers, but she probably does familiar herself, familiarize herself with the with the location, you know. Um, and and these mating flights are quite. A, there's a lot lot of, of, of flights she takes, like, and she obviously doesn't get mated in all of these. Um, and, and so and, and the initial ones are probably quite short. Uh, Roger probably could add to that. Um, well, I, I, I've never actually seen one go out um, uh, go out to mate, and in fact, I've only ever seen I think two uh, mating signs. So it, it, it's it is very rare for beekeepers to, uh, to see them. Uh, what I did come across on one occasion was the queen had she was about two or three months old, and um, uh, she was uh, she was out of lay, and um, she flew off the comb, and I thought that's the end of her, and um, closed it down went back the next inspection and there she was back there so i i've got a sneaking suspicion that she can um uh she can remember where she's come back to and if you think about it she's probably flying mile two three four miles um and then she's got to find her way back so my guess is that they're they are um having quite serious orientation flights so it's it, it's only guesswork bro yeah, I, I I agree. I agree. There, there must be something going because the queen is knows where her hive is because even say if you have um, if you have uh, if you have a swarm and the queen gets separated occasionally a queen can get separated from the swarm somehow and, and I've seen queen return to to her hive like you know um, and uh, she's obviously very familiar she she knows where her, her hive is so she is oriented somehow you know or oriented orientates somehow uh, before she leaves you know hmm. but definitely uh, mate, mating does not occur within the hive itself you know, that's, uh, you know it's definitely now you would occasionally get especially they suspect in amm you get this uh, especially in bad weather you can get um what's it called within a pre-mating uh, you know close close mating where it's kind of a a last resort, whereas the queen can't go out to the drone congregation area, but so she mates with drones in in the apiary, and, and, and you know, and, and that's been observed in uh, AMMBs. You know, as you know, in, in times of really bad weather, it's kind of a it's not ideal, but it's you know, it's one way of getting mating mated somehow. Um, I was seen to re remember reading um, uh, an account. Of, I think it was a French beekeeper, probably in the nineteenth century, um, uh, observed. Um, a drone and a, a queen mate in a, in a glass bell jar. I think it was a glass bell jar. Now, whether that was a mistake or, um, or perhaps even bumblebees, um, and, uh, and, and they will make very close. Yeah. Um, I've seen a mo uh, bumblebees make very close to the nest. Uh, so it might just have been that and a, a translation uh, well, problem. Well well, occasionally a drone and a queen can fall to the ground as well, of course, you know, occasionally that could, that has been observed, observed very, very occasionally where uh, you know, a queen with the drone that's still attached can, can actually fall down, whether that has been, you know, any reason for mistake, I don't know. I've had, I've had queens in mini nukes. Um, now, this isn't quite the same thing I know, but I've had queens in mini nukes um, that have flown off the, um, uh, off the comb. And for some reason, I find that they're, 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 they're very sort of flighty in, in, in mini nukes, flown off, and then they've come back to where they um, uh, 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 where, where they flown from. So um, uh, I, suspect, I suspect they do orientation flights. Definitely, probably. definitely. I've had that, uh, you know, and as you said, a queen, well, I find, the, you know, the young queen, the young queen is very flighty. Um, and... and you're there maybe trying to uh, grab her. Next thing she takes a wing and she flies around. Yeah, you yeah. see her, you can, you can hear her because she's quite heavy. Mm. You can hear her and you just stand well back and just hope, cross your fingers. And, uh, and you know, sometimes you'll see her coming in, in the door. Uh, other times, 
you don't see her coming back, will you t- next time you go go back and look and she's actually there, she has found her way back. Uh, and perhaps a, perhaps a last one then. Um, how best to deal with a colony which has become aggressive or def- overly defensive? Um, well. Yeah. Uh, well, obviously you have to get rid of that uh, that queen. So I mean, there's two parts to this question: how do you get rid of you know how do you get get rid of the old queen, um, and then how do you replace her? Um, you know, aggression. You, you should, if bees are aggressive, you shouldn't. You shouldn't stand for it. You shouldn't. You know, you should get that um, genetics out of there because it's just not. Uh, you know, it's the worst trait in, in bees. So I mean, you know, you, what you, well, and it is the foragers. The foragers, the older bees are. are you know, as, like I saw, they all tend to get grumpy as they get older. Um, so they're the ones that would cause the most problems. So you know, if you're looking for the, if you want to find the queen. To get rid of her, you would have to separate the foragers from um, from the queen. That's easy done by just moving the, the blue box uh, from the site and placing you know uh, another box there to accept the, the, the foragers, and then and then you can you know hopefully that'll be easier to find the queen. But even like you know if you're replacing a queen, uh, uh, and something that beekeepers don't do often enough um, when when they're not you know beekeepers who don't breed bees is you know it's very easy to raise queens like you should know i mean and you should by records know uh, which is your most docile colony which is your worst and ones in between so when you get rid of the uh, the, the, the queen as responsible for the aggressiveness you know uh, then you would just um, l- allow them to raise queen cells and come back a week later remove those queen cells and then go to your best colony and take a frame of um, young larvae, eggs and young larvae from that colony and put it into your aggressive one. And one step, then you've replaced, you're propagating your best queen, but you're also repra- replacing uh, an aggressive queen. And, it's, um, and, and that works very well uh, when, you, when you're not rearing your own queens. I'm sure Roger has a lot more to add to that too. Um, yeah, I don't wish to be disrespectful to the uh, questioner, but I'd need to know first um, what the issue is because I've been called out on many occasions right, just... um, for somebody who said, oh, my bees are bad tempered, my bees are bad tempered, and I go along there and I, I handle them without, without any problem uh, at all. Um, now, there could be several reasons why they're uh, aggressive. Um, there's a, a greater move these days not to use smoke. Some some bees, especially these um, yellow soft soft things, you 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 can handle without smoke. Now, if they have replaced the queen, then they are going to be probably a bit more defensive anyway, and smoke would normally uh, calm them down. Um, but you certainly wouldn't be able to. Um, uh, to handle them without smoke, so that could be uh, that could be a little bit bit, bit of an issue. Um, the number of colonies I've handled, which must be thousands, tens of thousands, so the same as Owen. Um, I only ever wear a, a veil. I don't. I've never ever worn a bee suit in my life, which is well known, and I don't wear gloves. Um, and the number of colonies that I've walked away from because I cannot handle them, literally, I can count on two hands. Um, so the, it, it is actually quite rare. Um, the trick that um, uh, Owen suggested uh, does work if they're not too bad. But there is a trick that I picked up a long time ago from the old beekeepers, that <coughs> if you put a protected queen cell, if you can get into the colony and, and put a protected queen cell in there, even though the existing queen is still there, there's a reasonable chance, and when I say reasonable, it's certainly more, better than 50% that super seed will take um, will, will will take place. Uh, and I've done that on um, quite a lot, lot of occasions. Interestingly, um, there's um, the, uh, the New Zealand commercial beekeepers very often do that as a matter of course, just for requeening. Yeah. They don't they don't bring, bring in their own queens. Um, uh, produce her own queens and then in- introduce them. Um, and so, uh, somebody showed me uh, a few weeks ago an account on the um, on the um, uh, on a New Zealand uh, a website. And what the blighters have done is they've actually taken one of my photographs off Dave Cushman's website. 
<laughs> to illustrate it and didn't even give it, give it give it credit or ask me. I, I, I don't mind that. Um, but um, you know, it just shows shows what can happen. Um, but that is uh, is a trick that, that does work quite often. Yeah, I think and I think definitely what Roger is saying, your aggression. I mean, if, if it's due to genetics, then you know, but you always have to, yeah, there's other reasons for bee speech and, and the time of year. It makes a huge difference, you know. Um, if you have bees, if you have a, a particularly bad June gap and you have strong colonies, they can, you know, they can get quite uh, a little bit cross. Um, so, you know, you have to rule out all those those things. And he's right, like, you know, beekeeping is a steep learning curve. And at the beginning, learning how to handle your bees is really important. And, uh, and you know, and, and the gentle touch, uh, that they won't because bees definitely will react badly to bad beekeepers. Um, I, I don't think it's, it's always that it's the case. Uh, I mean, I think there's a, there's a great move to give uh, beginners uh, really soft fro um, uh, bees, a five comb, comb nucleus of yeah. really soft bees. And um, uh, if they do happen to requeen and the beekeeper doesn't understand it, you can go, you, you can get F2 aggression. Uh, now, if these bees are already hybrids, it's the next generation, um, and the, the the poor beginner uh, just doesn't know how to handle um, uh, a colony with a bit of spirit, simply because they, they they've never had to. This this is, yeah, this is true. Like when I when I started beekeeping first, before my father uh, started uh, improving his bees, and a lot of bees in our area were, as you said, were um, hybrids or Italian uh, uh, black bees, and they were they were vicious. They're absolutely vicious. But the thing is, you know, uh, you, you're right, like, um, and, and especially beginners nowadays are not, they don't gain experience and handling bees are a little bit crosser. Uh, it, uh, you know, not, not immediately, like as I said, you can be given very plastic bees. Um, so it is, yeah. And this is one thing, like we're finding that now in some areas, uh, unexpectedly, uh, we have uh, areas where like conservation areas uh, of black bees and then somebody who is not a member of a local association buys uh, um, you know bees off the internet or um, and brings them and and then next thing uh, you find that there's outbreaks of aggression in a particular uh, in hives in, in a particular area like you know, and that is um, um, uh, and that's difficult to cope with you know well I see there are two two names up here that I'm uh, I'm uh, I'm aware of and that I've had um, had dealings with uh, one was, um, uh, uh, I won't identify the area, uh, but one hosted a two-day uh, course, and part of it was going into the teaching apiary to do uh, assessments on the colonies and get material to do to, to grafting. And um, the bees were so bad-tempered that um, the two people that went got absolutely hammered. And another instance, um, uh, a beekeeper... Um, wants to wants to produce decent bees, surrounded by several other beekeeping associations, and they've all got different ideas on which sort of bees. And this poor chap's right in the middle. And um, uh, the reason I know about it is because um, I was involved with an instrumental insemination um, uh, a, a, a demonstration, an instrumental insemination course workshop, really, um, simply because. Um, uh, the uh, the bees um, uh, around made made um, made his own bees so uh, so bad tempered that he was using or going to use instrumental insemination. So it it it, it does happen, and um, people say, "Oh, if if two aggression doesn't happen, uh, it jolly well does." Mm -hmm. Sorry, but yeah. Uh, an interesting point, though, what you said at the beginning about uh, handling them, and it might be a wise idea to have another. A beekeeper handle the bees to see if it's if it's the, your technique and, and the way that you're handling them. If you're not giving them enough smoke or whatever, it's uh, get get a friend in to uh, whether you don't like them. If you if you don't like them, get them to come and have a look at your bees. Yeah. Uh, excellent. Um, we... well, yeah, okay, yeah. Can I go sideways just a little bit because um, uh, there are other issues as well. One of which is it's well known that you can get twelve Hoffman spice and spice frames in a brew chamber. And very often people do. Well, then you cannot make the space. So you've got to roll bees when you pull one out. And I've seen bees go absolutely ballistic when that's happened. So it, it's not 
is not just bad handling. It's probably uh, lack of thought uh, setting the knives up. Well, I I use 12 frames, uh, Hoffman frames, but I tell all people that I'm mentoring are beginning to use 11 and and, and some sort of, uh, um, what do you call it, Um, thing at the back. Uh, So I would, I would, uh, you know, I always advise them to use 11, but I use 12 myself. But again, that's exactly what you were saying. Like, you know, if you're a beginner trying to get that 12 frame out, you don't have a chance in hell oh. getting that. Excellent. Well, we're at 10 to 9. Uh, thank you ever so much, Owen, uh, and to Roger Patterson for uh, helping us with some, uh, some Q&A there. Um, our next uh, session is next Tuesday. Uh, that's a beginners, um, beginners and intermediates um, uh, question and answer uh, session. Uh, so we would look forward to uh, seeing some of you there as well. We've got lots of questions. I'm hoping that uh, some people aren't too disappointed about the fact that we uh, we weren't able to ask, uh, answer all the questions, uh, but maybe we could sort something out uh, with with perhaps getting some answers to uh, so, to some of those. I, I don't mind if you want to. I mean, uh, you know. Just Excellent. My email and, yeah. That's brilliant. I'll uh, I'll send uh, some of those questions through and uh, and uh, we'll try and publish that so that uh, uh, we uh, we can answer as many as we can. Uh, thank you ever so much. Thank you to everybody watching uh, both uh, here in Zoom and uh, on uh, YouTube as well. Anything you wanted to say, Roger? Uh, only thank you to you for uh, for chairing it. But um, uh, for me, good night, everybody. Good night, Owen. Good night, um, uh, Richard. Good night, all.